part six of McCloskey's 1983 article is entitled Economics is Heavily Metaphorical. When we, uh, when we say metaphorical here, we're using a particular literary device or a literary figure uh, which can just simply be under in its most simple form is just understood as um, where you uh, describe something as something else even though it is not that something else so for example um, uh, Joe blogs as a lawyer was like a pit bull that's a simile so we're saying the, the lawyer is like something else. If we were to make it into a metaphor, we would say Joe Bloggs, as a lawyer, was a pit bull. McCloskey uh, opens with part A of this section, models are metaphors. So, say for example, when a, um, a physical chemist talks about water, uh, they just they don't talk about something that's you know a liquid that's wet or something like that something you know clear liquid that comes out of the tap they'll use a model to understand water and to talk about water and to analyze water and the model that they will use is the um, the molecule model that we've got here where we've got uh, a single uh, hydrogen atom and two, sorry, a single um, oxygen atom and two hydrogen atoms bonded to it. Uh, and this is a model that's used to talk about to talk about water. Now, of course, actual water molecules don't literally look like that, look like the first uh, picture there. And they obviously don't literally look like this writing here. That's absurd. Um, they are the model. This model of a water molecule is a metaphor for the real thing. Right? So McCloskey says that uh, metaphors are the most important example of e economic rhetoric. It's the most important uh, device, uh, literary or discursive device, that economists use. She gives a couple of um, classic examples. So the demand-supply model is a metaphor for a real market. Then we've got our downward-sloping demand curve, upward-sloping supply curve, which is standard, uh, it's a standard model in neoclassical theory to understand how a real market would operate. Obviously, in the real world, there are no literal downward sloping demand curves and literal upward sloping demand curves. Right? A, a, a real shop that you go into, you won't see a giant supply curve standing there. That's insane. It's nothing like that. Right? You don't represent, you are not literally a downward sloping demand curve wandering around in the streets. Right? And the meeting of you and the shopkeeper do not constitute the meeting of these two curves, literally speaking. That's insane. But nonetheless, we use this model as a metaphor for that real interaction between buyers and sellers. Similarly, game theoretic models are metaphors for interactions between real flesh and blood decision makers. So the payoff matrix shown here is showing two plays. This is a, um, a prisoner's dilemma game. And it could be used as a metaphor to try and understand uh, how two uh, prisoners might strategize about whether to confess or not to confess to the police. But you could use that metaphor, that model, to try and understand why it is you could replace those with, say, um, 
charge a collusive price or charge a competitive price and see then you can try and figure out why it is for example in a particular market where you've got two players that uh, it might be in their interests to collude with each other in fact end up competing with each other on price and there's various other examples that you could use the point is that of course in the real world in for flesh and blood decision makers this is not literally occurring this is a metaphor for what's occurring McCloskey doesn't say, which is really a bit of a side issue to some extent, that even the official rhetoric of methodology relies on metaphors. So this official methodology, this official rhetoric of methodology, which denies that there are that metaphors are in any way relevant, in fact uses metaphors itself. So when you say something like in official methodology, you would say the world is like this complex model that I've constructed. Then you can go further and say, well, this complex model that I've constructed is like a simpler model that I'm going to actually use, for example. Uh, these are, this is metaphorical talk. It becomes metaphorical talk. Well, that's expressed as a simile there. But you can see how you could easily fall into speaking metaphorically. The world is a complex model. And you find it in other discipline areas as well, where, say, in psychology, you'll have some people, some psychologists will say, the, the brain is like a computer. Or, falls into metaphor, the brain is a computer, right? is a wet computer. This is metaphorical talk. Part B of this section of the article is entitled metaphors in economics are not ornamental so meaning that they are not just they're not just fancy figures of speech uh, or you know bells on top of the real talk which is occurring McCloskey opens this by saying something which some people might think is extraordinary counterintuitive until you start looking at real life examples so she says that perhaps thinking per se so just thinking itself is metaphorical perhaps to remove metaphor is to remove thought now this is a slightly radical idea because sometimes it might be argued that metaphors are parasitic on literal speech so here McCloskey might be suggesting that that's uh, a bit too simplistic. Even the things that we think of as literal statements, in fact, rely on metaphors, but we just kind of forget that we're deploying metaphors. So, for example, I just took this as the simplest example I could find, where you've got this ad for Wagga Wagga, the spring guide, where it says, what's on in Wagga Wagga? Now, it's left out the apostrophe for what's, but, you know, what can you do? Apostrophe man will come along in the dead of night and kneecap whoever wrote this. But nonetheless, just look at the, uh, this seems like just a literal statement. What's on in Wagga Wagga? Think about the, even the simple word on. Okay, on, in implies that you've got a thing and then there's another object which you place on it. But that's not what's being said here. That would be a weird thing to think. There's no, for example, activity that's literally on Wagga Wagga and it's just made more complicated by adding the in. How can you have something on in something? It's either on it or it's in it. It can't be both. Right? You can have, um, I don't know, you could have something sitting on the lip of a cup. You could have something in the cup. But you can't have something on in the cup. That's ridiculous. Although this seems to be speaking literally, it's how we would normally think of it. Oh, this is just a literal statement. In fact, it's relying on 
metaphorical language. So this idea of if we wanted to get rid of these what are in fact metaphors, what are we left with? How are we going to describe what's on in Wagga Wagga? It seems impossible that we could do so. We couldn't just describe it, we could barely think it, is the point McCloskey's making. So metaphors are kind of absolute, they're necessary for thought itself. It's not some kind of extraneous extra. The metaphors in economics, um, and these are metaphors which are kind of well-known metaphors, convey novel thoughts and achieve insight. So they're important, they're necessary to the process of pro progress in economics, and presumably in other disciplines as well. So you can have metaphors operating in, in two directions, so to speak. So you could compare economic phenomena to non-economic phenomena. Uh, so this is a case where economics imports a concept from outside the discipline and repurposes it for its own use. And in doing so, in taking something from outside the discipline, a non-economic phenomena, and using it metaphorically for economic, uh, the purpose of economic analysis or economic thought, you, you're able to develop a new idea or express a new concept. So she gives some examples. Elasticity, so the price elasticity of demand. Elasticity is a term that's coming from physics and engineering, so the stretchiness of something. Um, so if we're thinking of price elasticity of demand, we're talking about when the price of a good changes by some percentage. How much does the quantity demanded change as a result, relatively speaking, in percentage terms? Does it change by a larger amount? That is, is it is it an elastic response, or does it change by a smaller percentage than the price change? That is, is it a relatively inelastic response? But the term itself, elasticity, obviously isn't referring to elastic band or, uh, or something like that. It's metaphorical. Another example is depression. So we might think, when we try to think literally about depression, um, we might be thinking of, um, from geography, say you've got... Um, a piece of land, and in that piece of land there's a depressed portion that is lower than the rest of the land around it. Um, or you might have a hill, um, and then uh, after the hill the, there's a depression in the land. So if we think of it as like... Um, so then you can start to think of, we can import this idea of higher and lower levels, we can import that into, say, the business cycle. The cycle itself is a metaphor, but anyway, uh, the business cycle. So when you have the uh, business cycle goes into decline, then we would say we have negative economic growth, GDP, real GDP is falling, then we would say we're falling into a depression. Or we don't use that term anymore. We now like to use terms like recession. But essentially, the old terminology would be called a depression. But that's a metaphor. It's imported from another area. Equilibrium. So this is where you have two opposing forces acting on, say, an object such that the object does not change its state in some way. And then we've got competition. You know, uh, running races and um, fighting between tribes or that sort of thing. And uh, initially, in economics, it, uh, the, the term competition had a meaning which was quite similar to that from outside the discipline, where it really meant a struggle between competing parties, uh, a struggle for a single goal, one party trying to kill off or defeat the other party to achieve the prize. But over time, even that metaphor itself transformed so that it came to represent a uh, really a state of affairs um, 
with certain kinds of characteristics or what we would call a market structure of a certain kind. That is where you have very many firms in the marketplace, many, many buyers in the marketplace. Each firm uh, was essentially identical to every other firm or very similar to every other firm. And no firm had any uh, substantial advantage over uh, any of their rivals. And then we've got where you can compare non-economic phenomena to economic phenomena. That is where economic concepts are applied to non-economic concepts, which is sometimes called economic imperialism, where the discipline of economics goes out beyond its traditional boundaries and starts to invade other disciplines with its concepts. So uh, McCloskey gives a couple of examples here of um, Gary Becker conceptualizes children as durable goods, like you know, like a refrigerator. So this is obviously metaphorical. You're applying the concept of a durable good to something outside for which there is a standard economic theory, and you apply that to a non-economic phenomenon like children and the acquisition and raising of children. So what's so great about that is that, again, McCloskey's point is that the application of this, of a metaphor, is that it gives insight that previously might not have been uh, possible without the use of that metaphor. So she says here that thinking of children as durable goods reveals that spending on children um, is used to generate a flow of parental utility over time, like with a washing machine. You spend a certain amount of money, you acquire this durable good. Well, why? What's so great about that? Well, over time, that durable good provides you with a flow of services or a flow of utility over time. And you can then start that you can start uh, extending the metaphor and saying, well, in the case of um, durable goods, it might be the case you need there's depreciation of the durable goods. They start to they cost money over time for upkeep to maintain them running um, in a satisfactory way, in a way that generates utility for the owner. So similarly, maybe for children, you have to spend money on their upkeep over time in order to generate utility for the parent. And you can think of workers' skills become conceptualized as human capital. And by thinking of workers' skills in this way, it reveals, for example, that education expenditure is the deferment of consumption. Also, from the perspective of the firm, you can say that spending on worker training to enhance the human capital of the labor that you employ, that spending competes with spending on equipment. That is, you can choose to spend more, the firm can choose to spend more money on worker training, but that means you're not spending that money on new equipment, for example. Now, that kind of thinking might not have those kinds of relationships might have might not have been evident if you hadn't thought about workers skills as human capital which can be augmented part c of this uh, section of the article is entitled economic metaphors constitute a poetics of economics poetics here means uh, it's the study of the literary forms that make up some discipline or other, in this case, economics. It doesn't mean poetry. She says a good metaphor should be so compelling. So uh, when we do descript, if you were to do something like descriptive poetics, it means you analyse what, what, what the literary forms are that are being used in a certain piece of work. Um, a normative poetics is one that attempts to make uh, value judgments about the different for the different literary forms which are utilized. And here McCloskey is hinting at that, I think, which says that a good metaphor should be so compelling 
that we come to regard it as the most illuminating, most insightful way to characterize something, despite it being literally false, as all metaphors are, they're literally false. So to give a non-economic example, and this is not coming from McCloskey, I'm just adding this in, um, it's a uh, King Richard was lion-hearted in battle. Now that's possibly more illuminating and more insightful than saying King, King Richard uh, was brave in battle, or King Richard ran around lopping off people's heads without regard to his own personal safety in battle. We might say that this, King Richard, was lion-hearted in battle, obviously is metaphorical. King Richard did not somehow become a lion heart in battle. That would not make for an effective fighter. Um, obviously not having any arms. But it's um, perhaps it tells you something about the character of the person. It tells you about his courage, it tells you about his ferocity, and so on. Um, another one might be, so this is from William Wordsworth, perhaps his most famous poem, the opening line of his most famous poem, I wandered lonely as a cloud. So this is telling you something about, it's not just saying, I walked along uh, in the, through a field by myself. That would be trying to speak literally. Uh, rather, we can express express that idea metaphorically, and it captures, it has connotations to it which would be more difficult to express literally in a pithy way. So here he's talking about how he's lonely. It's not really lonely per se. It's talking about solitude. So he's a solitary figure. And it's as if he's kind of uh, gliding along. Uh, he's just he's kind of become part of nature, so to speak, like a cloud. Um, and as you read through the rest of the poem, you realise that perhaps what he's talking about here is contemplation of walking through a field, and then he sees some daffodils, and then how fantastic that was. Um, but really, it's it's a kind of recollection of that. Uh, so the recollection is, in some sense, disembodied, like a cloud. Right? And it's uh, because it's recollection, it's something internal. It's, uh, it's inevitably a solitary activity, that contemplation of something which occurred in the past, or that reminiscence. Or you could say something like, um, uh, my friend was uh, so drunk that he, he wasn't able to uh, do anything the next day. Right? Or you could maybe express it metaphorically, and it gives more nuance, and it gives more... Um, uh, it adds connotations that might not otherwise have been available, and invokes an image which perhaps uh, tells you more than if you just said literally what happened. Okay. So, McCloskey says that the successful metaphors in economics become master metaphors of the discipline. So she gives the examples of competition, equilibrium, human capital, entry and exit. These are metaphorical terms, initially taken from outside of the discipline. Well, competition and equilibrium come from outside the discipline. Uh, but they were so powerful, so insightful, she claims, that they um, became embedded as um, absolutely central to theorization and interpretation of real-life phenomena. Uh, human capital is applying um, a concept from within economics to outside. Entry and exit is from well, not from any particular discipline outside of economics, but they're generic terms that come into economics. And it's referring to entry and exit to a market, 
how easy that is, how difficult that is, depending on the barriers to entry. Again, barriers to entry itself is a metaphorical term. Anyway, so uh, she says that all figures in theory are, in fact, analogies. So she's saying that um, theorization that occurs in economics, none of it is literal um, in any meaningful sense. It's all analogical even if people don't remember that. And she gives, um, puts together a little table in which she talks, just categorizes terms according to whether they're short and relatively simple or long and elaborate analogies. So a metaphor, a short, a um, metaphor is, a, is, is something short, so you might say, um, I'll just make up something here. So uh, consumers are pleasure calculating machines. There you go, that's a metaphor. But if we wanted to make a more elaborate version of that, we would have to have a, an allegory where we have our, our consumer as a, calcu a pleasure calculating machine that uh, gathers all of the available information about all of the possible options available to the machine. It then calculates the, um, the relative prices of all of those options available against the relative utility or relative satisfaction or happiness against each of those available options and chooses that bundle of options which the machine can afford to acquire with the resources that are available to it and in doing so is able to maximize its utility in that moment or maximize its pleasure or satisfaction in that moment. So that's a more elaborate version. Uh, then you've got a symbol. A symbol is, uh, so Y, the letter Y might stand for real GDP. Right? And real GDP itself is referring to the total amount of output produced in a given economy in a given time, in legally recognized markets. Um, but then you could have a more elaborate version, which would be a symbolic system. So you could have Y equals E, where E equals C plus I plus G plus X minus M. All right, so there you've got a symbolic system, and if you wanted to make a theory, you usually want to say that there's some kind of causal relationship between the symbols in this system in order to explain some phenomenon. And then you've got example, uh, which is the short version of something, so it's a simple little example, to, uh, which is two examples to illustrate a point, um, but a, an elaborate example would be, you can call that a story or a parable. So McCloskey says all of these kinds of literary figures make up uh, economic theory as we would normally understand it, although that might not necessarily be recognized by the practitioners themselves. D. Even mathematical reasoning is metaphorical. So the received view on this matter is, and this is coming from people like Samuels, Paul Samuelson and, um, and Koopmans, for example, maybe a few others, and it's become a common thought, amongst, especially amongst mathematical economists and some status, statistical economists as well, is that um, the natural language, natural language here is the language, we, the, the language we actually use, English, for example, or French or, you know, German, or whatever. Um, the natural language we use gives us a loose and imprecise account of something, but a mathematical expression of it gives us a precise quantitative, we should say quantitative account there, of the true underlying structure of the thing that we're interested in. And that's why we should ultimately try and express things in mathematical terms. Uh, because we get to, because if we're speaking mathematically, then, assuming that, you know, uh, a mathematical system 
perfectly pairs up with the underlying structure of reality, which itself is a kind of a metaphysical belief, um, then we're closer to the literal truth of the matter. Whereas if we use a natural language, we're always stuck with, with this vague metaphorical talk, which has all sorts of connotations, which might not necessarily be applicable and so on. But McCloskey says, but mathematical literalism, this idea that of mathematical literalism is just wrong, that mathematical thinking in economics is itself metaphorical and literary. So she says, for example, if you take the aggregate production function, so we represent the aggregate production function, so you just write out a function of um, uh, total output is a function of... Uh, exogenously given, say for example, exogenously given technology, um, some amount of labor and some amount of capital combined. Uh, that, she says, is really just a, it's a symbolic system and therefore is really metaphorical. That's not literally the world that, that, uh, uh, that function, which you can then represent with some kind of particular functional form in an equation, is not literally the way the world is. Um, and she says that this became acutely obvious in the Cambridge capital controversies of the 1950s and 1960s. Now that uh, controversy is... Um, elaborate and difficult to explain, um, but I'll have a go at giving you just the just the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, or at least one crucial aspect of it, in brief. The Cambridge capital controversies uh, were uh, debates which occurred between economists who were located at uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts in the United States, that is at large at the um, MIT, and their critics who were at the uh, University of Cambridge in the United Kingdom. One key aspect of this debate was, revolved around the uh, marginal productivity theory of interest. Um, which basically said that the marginal productivity of capital, that is, um, the amount of extra output that would be produced by an additional unit of capital, would, in a competitive free market uh, economy, uh, determine the uh, rate of interest on capital. This debate gets kicked off by Joan Robinson in the 1950s at uh, Cambridge University, uh, in which she points out that, well, when we think about this notion of capital, it's uh, often or usually expressed in in technical terms, that is in terms of the number of machines. So you add one machine, two machines, three machines to this, to the factory. Where we think of the whole economy as a giant factory. We just add more machines to it. She's saying that doesn't really make any sense because um, how would you aggregate all of this machinery when each piece of machinery in the factory is, heter is heterogeneous? They're all different to each other. So how would you do that? It makes no sense. So one uh, one tractor plus one shovel plus one computer chip, that's not one, two, three units of capital. How would you aggregate them? And the way that you would have to aggregate them is by expressing them in terms of value rather than in terms of the physical things themselves. So... All right, if we accept that, the unfortunate paradox ar that arises out of that is that the, the valuation of that capital necessarily presupposes a particular rate of interest, otherwise you can't value it 
unless you express it in terms of rate of interest or the, the price that you would have to pay. But that means that the rate of interest can't be determined by the marginal product of capital without reasoning in a circle, right? So in order to measure the amount of capital in value terms, you would need to know the interest rate. But then the interest rate would be determined by the additional amount of capital employed. So you seem to have a chicken and an egg problem here. And this was used as one of the uh, forks um, that uh, made up the pitchfork, which was trying to stab to death the whole notion of an aggregate production function as articulated by the economists at Cambridge, Massachusetts. There are other elements to that debate, uh, especially uh, the issue of something called re-switching, which you're not going to go into. But suffice to say, it became uh, very mathematical very quickly. Here's what McCloskey says. The combatants hurled mathematical reasoning and institutional facts at each other. But the important questions were those one would ask of a metaphor. Is it illuminating? Is it satisfying? Is it apt? How do you know? How does it compare with other economic poetry? And here she's talking about the aggregate production function. The reason there was no decision in the debate, well, as she interprets it, there was no decision in the debate, was that the important questions were literary, not mathematical or statistical. The continued vitality of the idea of an aggregate production function in the face of mathematical proofs of its impossibility and the equal vitality of the idea of aggregate economics as practiced in parts of Cambridge, England, in the face of statistical proofs of its impracticality, would otherwise be a great mystery. So here she's saying that it really wasn't about, although the interlocutors in this debate argued as if it all depended on the mathematics of it, or the institutional facts on the ground, uh, she says that, in fact, it really wasn't about that at the end of the day. It was about, was this notion of the aggregate production function, or of aggregate economics, or macroeconomics, per se, uh, was, it was really about, is it illuminating? Is it an illuminating metaphor? Is it a satisfying metaphor? Is it an apt metaphor? Okay, Those sorts of questions. And the fact that they're answered implicitly anyway by the practitioners, perhaps in different ways, explains why these metaphors, despite their, um, despite their mathematical weaknesses or despite empirical weaknesses, nonetheless continue to be used because people think they are illuminating or they are in some sense satisfying or apt for the particular purposes that they might be working with. But you would never be able to understand that fact without thinking of the aggregate production function as a metaphorical term. She goes on to say, following C.S. Lewis, who was a, um, uh, an English professor at Oxford, was a friend of uh, Tolkien, I think. Uh, so following C.S. Lewis, she says, any talk of any talk of causes, relations, of mental states or acts is incurably metaphorical. That's C.S. Lewis speaking. S escaping from verbal to mathematical metaphor does not escape from metaphor. You're still working with metaphors, it's just a different, uh, in a different form. She says, if economists forget and then stoutly deny that the production function is a metaphor, yet continue talking about it, the result is mere verbiage. Um, maybe we can think of an analogy that's not an economic one. 
So, for some theologians, when we talk about, say, God, and they talk about, oh, you know, God is a father figure who lives up in the sky, the theologian will say, well, that's metaphorical. We're not, that's not literally the case. If you were to forget the fact that it's metaphorical, so you say, you know, God, you know, God's a big, a, a big guy in the sky, then because you're not referring to, you're speaking literally, that is, you're speaking a, re, a, a referential way, that is, this, these words are referring to this thing, then it's just verbiage, because there is no thing like that. There is no big guy in the sky. Right? It becomes mere verbiage. Once you forget the metaphor is a metaphor and start thinking it's a literal thing. And uh, McCloskey goes on to say, you know, citing the authority of C.S. Lewis, that meaning is inversely related to literalness, which might be a little bit strong, but anyway, never forget that symbols are symbolic of something else. So, she says, uh, an economist speaking literally about the demand curve, the national income, or the stability of the economy, is engaging in mere syntax. So they've forgotten that it's a metaphor, and so they're, they're, they're using a term that allegedly refers to something which isn't really there. Part E. Literary thinking unites the two cultures. When she says the two cultures here, she's, um, she's implicitly referring to C.P. Snow's idea of there being two cultures, two disciplinary cultures in a way. One is the uh, humanities, if you like, the arts and the humanities, and the other side, the sciences and mathematics. So she's saying literary thinking enables you to unite these two cultures within economics. So can't, she asks the question, and can't the economist just get along without full awareness of his meaning? That is, he's using metaphors and so on, um, but doesn't really, isn't fully aware of that. And she says emphatically, no, you can't get, you can't really get along that way because the unexamined use of metaphors crowds out real thinking about what one is doing and saying. So once you've, you, you, you might be using metaphors, but you don't realize that you're using metaphors. You don't examine that this form of speech is metaphorical, then you don't ask the questions, why does this metaphor actually work? And also, what are the limits of this metaphor? I mean, how far can you take it before it becomes ridiculous? You need to, you, you don't ask those questions if you don't realize that they are metaphors. Right? So if you think of children as durable goods, there's limits to that. Right? And you have to recognize that there are limits to that. Otherwise, your analysis starts to become bizarre and disturbing if applied to policy. So, say, well, there's limits to it in the sense that obviously children are not like refrigerators in, the, in that. Once they irretrievably break down, you, um, you call the council and get the uh, broken down refrigerator taken away and put into a scrap dump and mushed up into little pieces and then recycled and used for other purposes. You wouldn't want to apply that to the case of children, one would hope. Also, metaphors evoke attitudes that should be kept, McCloskey says, kept in the open and under the control of reasoning, especially when those connotations are ideological. She says, it's better to admit that metaphors in economics can contain a political message than to use the jargon innocent of its potential. And she gives the example of the marginal productivity theory of labor, which um, a, few of eco a few economists uh, would say um, has ideological, not a few, many economists would say it has ideological implications within it, because the theory says that the um, the wage of a worker is determined by the marginal, or, or workers, the marginal depends on the marginal productivity of that additional worker. 
Okay, so which then has the implication in it or the connotation associated with it that, uh, in a sense, you get what you deserve, right? You have a low wage, that's because you're not very productive. You have a high wage, that's because your marginal productivity is high. Right? So you're getting, you're, you're being remunerated for your contribution and that in some sense the, the connotation there is that that's just or that's fair, that's how it should be. McCloskey's saying the metaphor of the marginal productivity theory of labour does have that connotation in it and therefore we need to be really aware of that and pay close attention to it and if necessary um, be able to say that maybe that, connota that connotation associated with the metaphor is inappropriate in this context. Or maybe not, I suppose it depends on the economist. <laughs>